A man protects his family, Frank, but who will be able to protect their family in this haunted town? Welcome back, guys, to Fog Entertainment. We are here today to review a brand new show. If you're in the horrors, if you're into thrillers, if you're into supernatural mystery like stuff, then this show from could be the show for you, and you can currently catch it on my GM Plus on Sunday nights. But we're here to review season one, episode one, the premiere, which was called Long Day's Journey into the Night, which is a kind of lengthy title for an opening episode, but we can work with that. It's Pilot would have done. Yeah, it's not a deal breaker. You know what? I, I think it's lazy when shows called episode one Pilot, so I, I have no problem with this longer title. Works for me. Yeah, the heck of top TV shows, literally they're all called Pilot, apart from The Walking Dead. Days Eek. gone by. Maybe it's something to do with horror. Could be, and uh, one of the main things that brought me to this series was the fact that the lead member, the, the top man of the show, is Harold Perenua, who is a um, pretty good actor, and we've seen him in big shows such as Sons of Anarchy, a personal favourite of ours. He's in Lost. It wasn't lost C as well. Nation. C Nation. We're well, just getting worse I mean, here. He was in C Nation for five minutes, but he was still in it. Yeah, it was, C Nation was weird because we felt like he was going to play the main character, but then he dies, like, you know, <laughs> five minutes into the show. But yeah, we're not talking about C Nation. Let's find out if he dies in From. So we start the show with Sheriff Boyd. That is who Harold plays. And he's walking down the streets here, walking down the town, ringing his bell. He's signalling. That it is time for the townsfolk to head indoors. He's making them know that nightfall is approaching. The sun is going down. And already, straight off the bat, you get like this eerie feeling that you don't want to be out here come dark. It's almost like there's a curfew. And Sheriff Boyd is saying, look, you have to get back inside, folks. Night is coming. So straight away, you're kind of like anticipating, well, what happens at night? Why does everybody need to get indoors? Uh, you've got Lauren, who is one of the residents in this town, and her daughter, she's playing out in the swings. Her daughter asks for five more minutes, and then we see Sheriff Boyd walk by. He's like, hey, Megan, listen to your mom. And, you know, Megan says, okay, she respects Sheriff Boyd's authority, which, you know, a lot of kids don't do in the real world. So can you imagine in the real world someone saying to a kid here, you have to go home now? I know. <laughs> be like, F off you. Probably would have got shot. Probably would have got shot, but yeah, she listens to Sheriff Boyd, which again makes you feel like there is a real danger here. And then Boyd continues to do his walk. Uh, then we see Megan go inside and they're, they're waiting on her uh, father, Frank, who's Frankie yet to boy. come home. But it, it turns out that Frank's in the local bar and he's passed out and he is not going to make it home. So we then see Sheriff Boyd, we get introduced to his lieutenant, his deputy, uh, Kenny. Kenny. Uh, Kenny! Kenny is an Asian man, so I don't know if that has any relevance here, but Kenny's Asian, if anyone asks. So. We've got all walks of life here, I'm loving it. Yeah, all walks of life. Uh, so Kenny is speaking to this woman that I believe he's got like a love interest in. Can't exactly remember, I think it's, what's her name? Christy. Cr uh, you know, I was going to say Susie, but Christy, Cr Susie. Christy. So we, we, ballpark. we get introduced to Kenny, we get introduced to Christy, but I mean, we don't really see much. You're literally talking like 10, 15 seconds. And uh, Boyd basically tells them, look, that's it, get home for the night, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk in the morning. So everyone's home, but we go back to the Lauren and Megan house in there. At the I forget their name. Do they have a name? Do they have a family name? I don't think so. Well, of course they do, but we just don't know it. Yeah, we, we're not, we don't know it. So they're getting ready for bed, and we see Megan do her prayers, and we hear her, like, knocks on the window, and apparently it's Grandma. It's Granny. Your Granny's at the door. Now, you've got to wonder, how would a Grandma be on knocking on a second floor window? I mean, Grandmas aren't really the most agile of uh, people, you know? I'm sure there's some athletic grannies, but I mean, most of them are not. Exactly, so this tells me that it's not your granny. So the fact that there's a granny kind of like hovering on a second floor window would uh, kind of tell me that there's something suspicious going on here, but she tells Megan, I'm your grandma, it's cold out here, will you let me in? Megan's like, uh, you don't look like grandma. Lauren tells her, Megan, that's not grandma. Get away from the door. But grandma tells Megan that she's lonely out here. Can you let me in? And then Megan 
being a kid and not knowing any better, opens the window. Lauren shouts no, but that doesn't stop Grandma from transforming into some sort of monster with massive fucking teeth and jumping through the window and turns out she murders them both. It, it seems like amateur hour here though for this family. Like surely if you are accustomed this well, of course we don't know anything. Should this kid really be in their own room when these things are outside and there's potential for them to open windows and interact with these creatures? That's a good point. However, we do find out that Sheriff Boyd had precautions to make sure that didn't happen. Then we cut to the Matthews family who are not in the town. They're going on some sort of like, I don't know, holiday, family trip in their RV. You see an RV and it reminds you of the good old days of breaking bad. So we get introduced to, well, that, when I see an RV, that's what I automatically think of. I don't know about you. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely. But I, at the time, I didn't, to be honest. So we get introduced to Jim, his wife, Tabitha, his daughter... What's her daughter's name? Ellie? No, it's not Ellie. I think it is Ellie. It's not. It's definitely not Ellie. Are you sure? I'm yeah. actually willing to bet heavy money that it is Ellie. It's not Ellie. Julie. It's not like Ellie. And the son is called... The son is called... Tyrone. No, it's definitely not Tyrone. Are you sure it's not Tyrone? It's definitely Wait, not. It's, what about Table Leg? Uh, Toby. No, it's not. No, Toby. No. Ethan. 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 So, Ethan. Yeah, Do you like my name, Table Leg? Aye. So we get introduced to them and they're on the RV. We can tell straight away that um, Jim and his wife are like, they're having problems. They're not really getting on. So I think the marriage here could... It's on be, the ropes. Yeah, it could be split. We, we later find out in the episode that uh, she had given like a miscarriage like not so long ago. So don't know when that was, but that could be what's leading to... Well, the, things are about to get worse. That could be leading to the family obviously um, breaking apart and they're, they're travelling in their RV and they come across a tree that is downed in the road so they go out they look at the tree Ethan thinks they should be able to push the tree with the RV but Jim's like don't be silly Ethan this RV can't push a tree then we get crows that appear and they, they start crowing I guess what noise does a crow make? Uh, they start doing that and the Matthews family decide that they are going to retreat and that they're going to have to go back in their RV, do a 180 and find another way past the tree. Do you think they seemed a bit more creeped out about the crows rather than other stuff this episode? Like I know crows act weird and that's like a symbol, oh death, whatever, but I feel like there was almost a big freak out here for no reason. You know, they don't really find anything else out this episode though. Well, I'd say going around in circles and end up in the same place is creepy. Well, hold on, I think they do freak out about that. Oh, but it's like similar. Like, oh, fuck, there's crows, get back to the RV. They, listen, they were walking back, they were like sheepishly oh, about fuck, it. we should go. I'm, all, all right, well, I'm not saying it was similar levels, but my point is, I, I feel like there was almost an over-exaggeration here about the crows. I know if I, I, if I broke down the car and I saw a couple of crows doing some weird stuff, I'd be like, alright, I'll just move on. I'd lift the fucking tree and toss it at the road. All righty. Uh, then we get Frank coming home the next morning. He's drunk. He walks to his house. He sees a bunch of people outside. He's like, uh, what's happened here? Is Lauren having another bake-off? He kind of laughs, but none of the residents outside his house are laughing. And then Sheriff Boyd comes out, and he just comes out, and he, like, slaps the shit out of Frank. It's like, what I tell you, Frank? You have kids. You nail the goddamn window shut. Uh, Frank's like, Blubber in here, he's um, I'm oh, blah, blah, blah. I'm sorry. and uh, Boyd's not having it, so Boyd grabs Frank and he drags him upstairs. Frank doesn't want to look, but he's like, Oh, you're gonna look, and he takes him into the bedroom where Kenny's waiting. And we see the dead bodies of Lauren and Megan. And it's like their entire rib cage, like their stomachs have been gutted. Yeah, maybe it's like they rip out all the organs, hearts, kidneys, lungs, intestines. Everything. Could they be like uh, organ donors or something? Like, I mean, stealing these, selling these organs on the black market? But no, I like it about this, right? Not the fact there's two dead bodies on the floor and there's no organs, but that tells me it's proper horror. It's not like they just disappear or they, or they just die and they pass out. There's no blood. There's actual gore. Yeah. I like that. Boyd wants Frank to look. Frank does not want to look. And then he points a gun. Oh, you're going to look, Frank. You're going to let a man protect his family. I actually thought he was going to kill him here. And uh, Kenny, I think, tries to calm down Boyd a little bit. Then... <laughs> you, have, you you lock him up. Lock him up, son. Uh, Boyd then goes to leave. And then we see the priest come around. A priest arrive. And him and, 
him and Boyd come have like a wee moment where they look at each other and I thought something really bad was going to happen here the first time I watched it, but thankfully Boyd just walks it. What do you think? We think Boyd was going to deck him? No. I thought it was going to be worse than that. Oh, did you? Aye. Right. Oh, damn. They, wee, they had this wee look, you know, like at each other and I thought, oh Christ, no, not this. But, oh, nah. I get you. Yeah. But um, no, they, they walk out. Uh, uh, <laughs> they walk out. There was no um, Bill and Frank here, so sure. thank God for that. Maybe episode two will be Bill and Frank. <laughs> Broke back mountain, Boyd and Priest. <laughs> uh, so they then leave, and later on we see them getting a funeral service for Lauren and Megan. At this stage, the Matthews arrive in town, and they stop. Jim gets out and just kind of like interrupts the funeral service. I thought this was very rude. I thought this was a dickhead move from Jim. Yeah. It's all, like, see at the end, all, all that's happened to them is they're lost, and all, there's a couple of cars with... Uh, their tyres are blown out. Yeah, at this stage they don't really know anything apart from oh, there some crows sitting on that tree. Uh, so, they, I mean, th this is not this is not like a major like uh, emergency. I don't think they should have been like interrupting this funeral service, but they did. Uh, Jim's like asking for their... And as soon as Boyd sees them, he's kind of like, right, come on, wrap this up. <laughs> There's people here. Come on, doesn't matter who gives a shit. Who cares dead? who died? We gotta wrap this up. There's no people here. Uh, Jim tries to ask some people for directions. They just completely blank him. Maybe that's what he deserves for interrupting this funeral, though. Then Boyd comes up and Boyd speaks to him and he tells him, well, if you keep going that way, you, you, you'll find where you want to be. You'll where, get back to the highway. Don't worry about it. You'll find peace. Then Jim is like, right, okay. Jim jumps back in his RV and the, the, the Matthews family kind of seem a little bit, I wouldn't say freaked out, but they, they, they don't really, I don't think they like these uh, town folk. <laughs> Death, no, even looking at this town, you can tell something's up. Yeah, you got cars upside down, things just look like they belong in the... Well, I don't know when this was set, like, but it looks like 100 years ago. Um, so yeah, they, they make their way, they go up the road. However, about 10 minutes later, they find themselves back in the town. Which they can't really believe because they were like driving straight, they didn't like do a 180. So um, they keep on going, they ask one of the residents, Sarah... But again, she just blanks them like everybody else does, and they make their exit again from the town. We then get Boyd and Kenny. They are discussing what they're going to do with these people, and Kenny's like, uh, Boyd's like, just leave it to me. Everyone remembers their first time in the town. He says he will deal with it alongside Kenny. Uh, then we see them go back. They're arguing about driving. And they find themselves back in the town after driving for a prolonged period of time. The family are freaking out. To beef is like, how is this possible? You didn't, you didn't go around in a circle. You drove in a straight line. How can this lead back to the town? And I question that. How can a straight line lead back to this town? No, yeah. At this point, things are up. You've, you've got because, like, I mean, I'm very good with direction. So surely anyone with any sort of directional sense knows this can't happen. It can't happen. Uh, Jim, at this point, I think he's had enough, he's like, screw this shit, so he, he pulls into the diner, does a 180, and goes back the way he came. So he figures that, you know what, If maybe if we go back the way, we can get out of here. So they're going back, the family still continuing to argue, Tabitha's like, you know, maybe you should slow down, it's like, I'm going 20 miles an hour, God damn it. They're looking for turn-offs, but there's no turn-offs. Boyd and Kenny... Then prepare, prepare fire trucks. I guess they're going to stop the Matthews the next time they drive through town. Uh, and then, I mean, is this, I mean, couldn't this cause an accident, like, preparing these tire tracks? Of course not, yeah. Like, what, what actually happens could happen with this entire thing. Like, the RV could just fly off the road, but this must be the way they stop everyone. Maybe that's why all the tires are out. I suppose, because, like, Boyd, if Boyd says to him, like, you have to stay here forever now, I mean, what's he going to say? I mean, oh, that's all right, mate. Here's the RV. Here's the keys. <laughs> uh, so they're trying to make their way, and then they see another vehicle. They're like, here, let, let's ask this. Let's ask them for help. But it turns out this vehicle is, like, out of control, and they crash. We got a big crash. The vehicle kind of, like, crashes into, like, a tree. But the RV plunges off the side of the road and crashes into the woods. Yes, and then this is when the entire Matthews family, if you're not wearing your seatbelt, you're probably not looking good here, but I think the only guy wearing a seatbelt was, uh, what's his name? Jim. Jim. But he actually, he's very lucky here, because the tree absolutely smashes through the windscreen. And it like, it cops him in like a nice wee position. I would just, he's just nice and toasty sitting there. He's got like, he's in between it's both. Like a roller coaster. He's in between two branches, you know what I mean? It's like, it's kind of like weird. I yeah. mean, a couple of inches to one side, like, and Jim could have been dead. 
Yeah, and then you've got Ethan, whose leg is absolutely humped here. The table leg just went right through it. Right through his leg. Julie's yeah. complaining of her sore back. And, and Tabby's knocked out. Uh, Tabitha is laying there, not moving. We then see one of the guys from the car run back to this town. We finds out his name is Toby. He alerts Boyd what's happening. Boyd tells Kenny to uh, get, get reinforcements. And Boyd runs to check to make sure that everyone's okay. Boyd reaches the he reaches the incident first. He handcuffs the other guy in the car to the car door who seems out of it. Yeah, they they, used to get, they must have been high. I believe his name is Jade, and he's saying like, "Oh, you're beautiful and all this stuff," and he just seems like he's absolutely off his rockers. Boyd then goes to check on the Matthews family, checks on the RV, makes sure everyone's okay, tries to calm down Jim. He then gets inside and uh, he looks at the rest of the family and he manages to get Julie from the RV. He also checks on Tabitha and she's still breathing, so this means everyone can be... Everyone's uh, happy for now. We're all right. But Jim, Jim's still stuck. It's weird. He's trying to push the tree, trying to escape, but he's stuck there. He can't do anything. Um, Boyd then gets Julie to a tree outside and then the rest of the cavalry come. You've got Kenny... You've got, uh, what's her name? What's her name? The doctor. Christy. But see, right, see the daughter, uh, what's her name, Julie? Mm-hmm. Right. Now, they're saying her back was sore, but it looked like with assistance, she got up really easy, and it looked like she could almost got up by herself. Like, I'm not saying here, I've never been in a car crash to this extent, but I feel like she jobbed her family out here. What kind of car crashes have you been in? Oh, jobber ones, taps. I haven't been in massive ones, I think that's my point. Uh, yeah, so she gets helped out. And then, like I said, the rest of the people come. You've got Father Catry, you've got Kenny, you've got uh, Christy. And you have Boyd's son, who he does not get on with at all. For whatever reason, we don't really know. Yeah, it's weird. There's just nothing really... I'm going to guess here, I mean, I think maybe he blames his dad for their mum, mum dying or something. Maybe it'll have something to do with how they got here. Who knows? He holds resentment towards his daddy, Boyd. Yeah, him and his dad don't get along, so... Which is evident earlier in the episode where we see Boyd go to visit his son, Ellis. And he goes to, like, the house, like, the colony house, and it seems to be, like, a house where... Like, all the misfits just kind of go and stay. It's like a big party house in the town, so... It is a bit weird that Ellis isn't isn't staying with his father. He has uh, got he's he's living in the colony house, and he when when Boyd goes to try and speak to him, Ellis isn't really interested. Ellis is currently at that point he is painting a picture of his girlfriend, and I felt like that was kind of rude when Boyd goes to see Ellis. He just kind of like blanks him, and it's like wants nothing to do with him. Boyd tells Ellis that they lost people last night, and he just doesn't seem to care. Yeah, he almost like. Pin it on boys, like, ah, well, it's what you do, big man. Again, his dad getting unfairly treated here, but I guess we'll find out. I don't think whatever he's done's warrant this. This just seems to me like petty teenage behaviour here. It does, but speaking of uh, fathers that do get on with their sons, we, earlier we seen Kenny playing chess with his father, who seems to be suffering from some sort of dementia. Uh, dementia. Yes, and he has to go into the basement at night because he'll but, open doors. But that doesn't stop him from uh, winning chess games because he's very good at chess. Apparently he's never lost. Should have entered the World Championship for Could, chess. I mean, I mean the town, there might not be much going for the town, but it looks like they at least have a, a World Champion chess player available. Uh, back at the incident, though, everyone is helping them out. They're, they're trying to get everybody out. They get Tabitha out. They, then they get Jim out, and it leaves just um, Ethan, who is still trapped in the RV. We see Christy, the medic, trying to help. She's trying to make sure that he's secure and that he's stable. Uh, Jim then goes to speak to his family, but Tabitha's complaining that Boyd has told them that they need to leave. Jim's like, we're not going anywhere. My son's in there. Uh, and then Boyd's like, look, please listen to me. I don't want to bury any more kids today. And Jim's like, right. So, I mean, Boyd tells them that the woods are not safe at night. And I don't think, I don't think they really know what he means. Like, if someone said to me the woods are not safe at night... I would maybe assume there's uh, some sort of like wolves or something, like or some form of animals or something like that. You would your first thing would not be oh the supernatural things going on here. There's demons in there. Yeah, so kind of <laughs> Boyd then tells them to just look 
why don't you get you get your wife and your daughter back to the town and you can stay here with Ethan tonight. Back in the town though, where we seen Toby earlier, that was the other member from the car that was in the crash. He's back in like the hospital bed getting looked after. We see dementia Asian grandma getting what was the name? Lou? We see Lou getting taken to the basement after his game of chess. Lou says he doesn't like Toby, the newcomer. One of the nurses asks, why is that? He says, look at the mess he made. And it's like, and she goes, that's not his fault. I mean, what's this old guy's problem? This Toby guy's been in a car crash and he's complaining. He, I doesn't, know. he doesn't like him. Maybe he forgot them. Maybe they explained he was in a car crash and he's forgot. He's like, he's making a mess. I don't make a mess. I dribble into my soup. So yeah, yeah he's taken to the basement. We then see Sarah who's looking after Toby. Sarah um, get, gives him water. She's asking him some questions and stuff like this. And... Toby's answering the questions, he wants to know where everyone is, she said, ah, oh, you're going to be okay, it's fine, then she says that, um, you know, that this isn't your fault, and Toby seems a little bit confused, and then Sarah, like, drives a screwdriver up in through his, like, mouth, throat, and it comes out through his mouth and tongue, and it's, uh, it didn't look like a good way to go. No, it was a brutal death. And he kind of just, like, bleeds out on the hospital table, and, and Sarah's left there, just having killed somebody, so, you know, we, we thought the danger was... From some sort of like, <laughs> we we didn't think the danger was from people that were in the town. Let's put it that way. But we see Sarah, one of the town residents, just killing Toby, who was in the car crash here. So yeah, I wonder what the reason is behind this. Could there be more? Could there be several dangers in this town? We do not know. Boy, then back at the crash, says that they're going to stay there tonight. He asked Christy uh, if they stay tonight. Can she work on his leg? Can she save the boy? He's like, yeah. Uh, Kenny doesn't think this is a good idea. He's like, you can't stay out at night. But Boyd says, look, we've got this. But Boyd holds up the talisman, and apparently that means you're safe from the night. This talisman is supposed to protect you from the monsters. And it's essentially like a shield that doesn't allow them in. And if you've noticed throughout the beginning of this episode, it's like all the houses and like all the um, buildings and stuff, they've all had like talismans at the door. Yep, in the diner I noticed that. So this is to like protect people from the monsters in the town. At this stage, we get Kenny. He takes back Jim's family, his wife and daughter, alongside um, Jade, who was in the car crash, and Ellis, Boyd's son. And we're left in the RV with just Jim, Christy, Boyd, and Ethan, who is still stuck, still impaled. They're then working on Ethan. Boyd's trying to secure the RV, He's like, uh, Jim, can you pass me that blanket? Jim passed him the blanket, and he's, like, putting the blanket up to kind of, like, cover the back of the RV, trying to cover the windows and, and try and shield them in the back of the RV. Jim asks, what is he doing? Boy's like, you know, I'm trying to keep the RV safe. I'm trying to protect the RV. Um, Jim asks him, what are you protecting it from? But at this stage, Ethan wakes up, yeah. kind of distracts. Uh, Jim and he can't, I guess, ask Boyd his questions. Uh, they then focus on the kid, but uh, we can hear things coming from the woods. We see things coming. We from see the woods. things coming from the woods, and uh, <laughs> Boyd looks it. And then back on the the car, we, when they seen them, when they see the all group trying to get back to the town, they run over the ta the tire tracks that were put out earlier, which the was like I mean, which was really, I mean, come on. Well, that's, that's a, a, that's that's a, a rookie. Yeah, man, that's kind of rookie. Like, I mean, I, I get it. A lot's happened, and you probably forgot, and you're in a rush to get back to the town. Was Kenny driving? I think he was. That just makes it even worse. Uh, but you can kind of understand, I guess, they're in a rush, but still, I mean, you know, it's <laughs> bursting your own tires. They start freaking out. They get out and they discuss that uh, we're going to have to run to the colony house because that's the closest place to us, and I don't think we'll make it back to the town. Kenny doesn't know if they're going to let them in, but Ellis is like, no, they'll they'll let us in. And then they tell everyone, look, we need to run here. Don't look behind you. If you see anything, don't stop. Keep on running. And then they make their way through the fields to the colony house. And back in the RV, you've got Boyd. He peeks open the uh, the blankets. And then you can see just like a bunch of figures and bodies surrounding the RV as they get closer. And that's where the episode ends. Yeah, so, absolutely yeah. spooky ending there. Suspense. You don't know what's going to happen. Is the group with the tires, are they going to make it to the house? Is Ethan going to survive? What's going to happen inside the RV with all these figures at night approaching? Why did Sarah kill Toby? What the hell is going on in this town? So many questions. I think 
were asked in this premiere and it's like you do not know the answer so straight away you're intrigued and you, you want to know more for me i thought it was a great premiere i thoroughly enjoyed it i think it's it's different from anything i've seen i don't think i've seen another series that i would say is similar to this people have compared it to lost a little bit which i guess it's maybe a bit like lost but with a more spooky supernatural horror theme to it yeah could the, you argue that it's got a similar premise of like an unknown I feel like we lost, though. It lost. It kind of just feels like they're on an island. This feels like something bigger's at play straight away. I feel like it lost. You've got the whole idea, right? They're on an island. Even though in like, the first episode of Lost, you think, here, is that like a dinosaur that's just attacked them? Nothing really like that here, but I'm liking it. I'm liking the horror elements, and it's got Big Harold in it. Lost. Lost Legend. And I like the characters, you know. There's not one character straight off the bat that I thought, you know, I don't like. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Well, I mean, Frank seems like a bit of a douchebag to leave his family at home in this sort of world, but apart from him, you're just not really supposed to like him, so that's all good. Um, you yeah. know, but he just seems more like a drunk waster rather than a bad person. Well, no, I agree, but I mean, I'd argue they are bad people then. Well, that is true. That is true. So yeah, guys, we are looking forward to episode two to see who survives, who doesn't survive. But yeah, based on the premiere, I really enjoyed it. I would personally give it a 9 out of 10. I thought it was a really good premiere. I enjoyed it. Yes. I liked it, and it's got me excited to watch the rest of the show. I'm going to get an eight. Very good, strong. One of the best premieres you'll get, yeah. especially these days. Eight point five out of ten. Then eight point five is good. Definitely one of. The, I think it's one of the best premieres of a show I've watched. I, I still think the Strain episode one's the best premiere I've ever seen. But this one is definitely. I would go as far as saying this is probably my top five premieres. No, I, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think maybe if you're going to take some things away from it, maybe it reveals too much. Like, there's like a town, there's like loads of people. Maybe they could have went a bit more, like... If, like how, how do you not reveal the town in episode one? Oh, that's the but again, I also think that's good, because I, I, I think it gives you a lot, but without giving too much away, in my opinion. It's like, do you, so I, I think it does... I think it shows you a lot to intrigue you, but it doesn't spoil too much, in my opinion. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, 8.5, very good. And you know what? 10 episodes this season, isn't there? So 10 episodes in season one, 10 episodes well, in season Will any episode two. be episode one? I actually think it will. I think it will get better with the intrigue. Well, we'll find out, guys. Uh, make sure you leave a like, make sure you subscribe, comment down below. We will catch you in episode two. But we're also going to make theory fits uh, throughout the season, so make sure you check out for that, because there's lots of things to discuss here. There's lots of things that we need to know answers to. Why certain things happened? What is happening? Why did so-and-so do this? There's so much questions that need to be answered, and we hope that together we can help answer them on Fog Entertainment. That's it. Premiere from. We'll catch you in the next one. And until next time, peace. And remember, a man's supposed to keep his family safe. <laughs>